Okay, we're back covering AWS Storage Day 2022 with Ashish Pelikar, who's the general manager of AWS EBS Snapshot and Edge, and Cami Tavares, who's the head of product at Amazon EBS. Thanks for coming back in theCUBE, guys. Great to see you again. Great to see you as well, Dave. Great to see you, Dave. Uh, Ashish, we've been hearing a lot today about companies, that, ooh, all kinds of applications to the cloud and AWS and using their data in new ways. Resiliency is always top of mind for companies when they think about just generally their workloads and specifically the clouds. How should they think about, customers think about data resiliency? Yeah, when we think about uh, data resiliency, uh, it's all about making sure uh, that your application uh, data, that the data that your application needs is available uh, when it needs it. Uh, it's really the ability for your workload to mitigate disruptions uh, or recover from them. And to build that resilient architecture, you really need to understand what kinds of disruptions your applications uh, can, can experience, um, how broad the impact of those disruptions is, um, and then how quickly you need to recover. And a lot of this is a function of what your application does, how critical it is, and, and the thing that uh, we constantly tell customers is it, this works differently in the cloud uh, than it does in a traditional on-premises environment. What's different about the cloud versus on-prem? Can you explain how, how it's different? Yeah, let me start with the, uh, the on-premises one. Um, and in the on-premises one, uh, building resilient architectures is, is really the, the customer's responsibility and, and it's, it's very challenging. You have to start thinking about what your single points of failure are um, to avoid those, uh, you have to build in redundancy. Uh, you might build in replication as an example for storage. Um, and, and doing this now means you have to have provision more hardware. Um, and depending on what your availability requirements are, uh, you may even have to start looking for multiple data centers, um, some in the same region, some in different geographical locations. Um, and you have to ensure that you are you're fully automated um, so that your recovery processes can take place. And as you can see, that's a lot of onus being placed uh, uh, placed on the customer. One other thing that we that we hear about um, is, is really elasticity and, and how elasticity plays into the resiliency for applications. As an example, if you experience a sudden spike in workloads uh, in an on-premises uh, uh, environment, um, that can lead to resource saturation. And so really you have two choices. One is to sort of, throttle the workload and, and experience resiliency, or your second option becomes buying uh, additional hardware and securing more capacity um, and keeping it fallow uh, in case of experiencing such a spike. And, and, and so your, your two propositions are either experiencing resiliency challenges or, um, or uh, paying really to have infrastructure that's, that's lying around. And both of those are different uh, really when you start thinking about the cloud. There's a third the option. Contrast, There's a third option yeah. too, which is lose data, which is not an option. Right, go is, ahead. This please. is not a, not, please, yeah, I, 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 I mean, pretty much as a, as a storage person, um, that, that is not an option um, we reason about, uh, or that, that we think is reasonable for customers to take. Um, the big contrast in the cloud uh, really comes with how we think about, um, how we think about capacity. And fundamentally the, the cloud gives you that access to capacity. So you're not managing that capacity. The infrastructure complexity and the costs associated with that are also just a function of how uh, infrastructure is built uh, really in the cloud. Um, but all of that really starts with the bedrock of, of how, we, how we design for avoiding single points of failure. Um, the best way to explain this um, is really to start thinking about our availability zones. Uh, typically these availability zones consist of multiple data centers uh, located in the same regional area to enable high throughput and low latency for applications. Um, but the availability zones themselves are physically independent. Uh, they have independent connections to utility power, standalone backup power resources, uh, independent mechanical services, and independent network connectivity. We take availability zone independence uh, extremely seriously um, so that when customers are building the availability of their workload, they can architect using these multiple zones. And that is something that uh, when I'm talking to customers or Cami's talking to customers, we highly encourage uh, customers to keep in mind as they're building resiliency for their applications. Right, so you can have 
the, the, in, within an availability zone, you can have you know, instantaneous, you know, when you're doing a write, you've got, you've captured that data mm -hmm. and you can asynchronously move to outside of that in case there's, you know, the very low probability, but it does happen, you get some disaster, you're minimizing yeah. that, 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 that RPO. So, and, not, and I don't have to worry about that as a customer and figuring out how to do three site data centers. That's right. But, but like take that take that even further. Now imagine if you're expanding globally, all those things that we described about like creating new footprint and creating a new region and finding new data centers as a customer in an on-premises environment, you take that on yourself. Um, whereas with AWS, um, because of our global presence, you can expand to a region and bring those same operational characteristics to those environments. And so again, uh, bringing resiliency as you're thinking about expanding your workload, um, that's another benefit um, that, you, that you get from using the availability zone region architecture that AWS has. And, and, and as Charles Phillips, former CEO of Infor said, friends don't let friends build data centers, so I don't have to worry about building the data center. Let's bring Cami into the discussion here. Cami, yeah. think about elastic block storage. It gives you know, customers, you get persistent block storage for EC2 instances, so it's foundational for any mission critical or business critical application that you're building on AWS. How do you think about data resiliency in, in EBS specifically, I always, I always ask the question, what happens if something goes wrong? So how should we think about data resiliency in EBS specifically? Yeah, uh, you're right, Dave. Block storage is a really foundational piece uh, when we talk to customers about building in the cloud or moving uh, an application to the cloud and data resiliency is something that comes up all the time. And uh, with EBS, you know, EBS is a very large distributed system with many components. And, and we put a lot of thought and effort to build resiliency into EBS. So we design those components to operate and fail independently. So when customers create um, an EBS volume, for example, we'll automatically choose the best storage nodes to address the, the failure domain and the data protection strategy for each of our different volume types. And um, part of our resiliency strategy also includes separating what we call a volume lifecycle control plane, which are things like creating a volume or attaching a volume to an EC2 instance. So we separate that control plane from the storage data plane, which includes all the components that are responsible for serving IO to your instance and then persisting it to durable media. So uh, what that means is once a volume is created and attached to the instance, the operations on that volume, they're independent from the control plane function. So even in the case of an infrastructure event, like a power issue, for example, you can recreate uh, an EBS volume from, from a snapshot. And, and speaking of snapshots, that's the other core pillar of resiliency in EBS. Snapshots are point in time copies of EBS volumes that we store in S3. And, and snapshots are actually a regional service. And that means internally, we use multiple of the availability zones that Ashish was talking about to replicate your data so that the snapshots can withstand the failure of, of an availability zone. And so thanks to that uh, availability zone independence and then this built-in component independence, customers can use that snapshot and recreate a, an EBS volume in another AZ or even in another region if they need to. Great, so okay, so you touched on some of the things EBS does to build resiliency into the service. Now thinking about or, you know, over your right shoulder is you know, joie de vivre. So what can <laughs> organizations do to build more resilience yeah. into their applications on EBS so they can enjoy life without anxiety? <laughs> that is a great question. Also something that we, we love to talk to customers about. And, and uh, the core thing to think about here is that we don't believe in a one size fits all approach. And so what we do in EBS is we give customers different tools so that they can uh, design a resiliency strategy that is custom tailored for their data. And so to do this, this resiliency assessment, you have to think about the context of the specific workload and ask questions like, what other critical services depend on this data? And what will break if this data is not available? And how long can, can those systems withstand that, for example? And so the most important step, I'll mention it again, snapshots. That is a very important step in a recovery plan. It's make sure you have a backup of your data. And so uh, we actually recommend that customers take the snapshots at least daily 
And we have features that make that easier for you. For example, Data Lifecycle Manager, which is a feature that is entirely free. It allows you to create backup policies, and then you can automate the process of creating the snapshots. So it's very low effort. And, um, and then when you want to use that backup to recreate a volume, we have a feature called Fast Snapshot Restore that can expedite the creation of the volume. So if you have a more, uh, you know, a shorter recovery time objective, you can use that feature to expedite the recovery process. So that's backup. And then the other pillar we're talking to customers about is data replication, which is another very important step when you're thinking about your, your resiliency and your, your recovery plans. So with EBS, you can use replication tools that, that work at the level of the operating system. So that's something like DRBD, for example, or you can use AWS Elastic Disaster Recovery and that will replicate your data across availability zones or, or nearby regions too. So uh, we talked about backup uh, and, and replication. And then the last uh, topic that we, we recommend customers think about is having a workload monitoring solution in place. And you can do that in EBS using uh, CloudWatch metrics. So you can monitor the health of your EBS volume using those metrics. We have a lot of tips in our documentation on how to measure that performance. And, and then you can use those performance metrics as triggers for automated recovery workflow, workflows that, that you can build using tools like auto scaling groups, for example. Great, thank you for that advice. Just quick follow-up. So you mentioned um, your recommendation, at least daily. W what kind of granularity, if I want to compress my R RPO, can I go in a more granular level? Yes, you can go more granular and, and you can use, again, the data lifecycle manager to define those policies. Great, thank you. Um, before we go, I, I want to just quickly cover what's new with EBS. Uh, Ashish, maybe um, you could talk about, I, I understand you've got something new today. You've got an announcement. Take us through that. Yeah, uh, th th thanks for checking in and, and I'm so glad you asked. Um, we, talk, we, uh, we, we talked about how snapshots um, uh, uh, help resilience and, and are a critical part of building uh, resilient architectures. Um, so customers like the simplicity of backing up their EC2 instances uh, using multi-volume snapshots. Uh, and what they're looking for and what they uh, is the ability to, uh, to back up uh, only uh, to exclude specific volumes from the backup, especially those that don't need backup. So think of applications that have uh, cache data or applications that have temporary data that really doesn't, doesn't need backup. So today we are adding a, a new parameter to the create snapshots API, which creates a crash consistent um, uh, set of snapshots for volumes attached to an EC2 instance, where customers can now exclude specific volumes uh, from an instance backup. So customers using data lifecycle manager that, that Cami touched on uh, can automate their backups. And, and again, they also get to exclude these specific volumes. So really the feature is not just about convenience, uh, but it's also uh, to help customers save on costs um, as, as many of these customers are managing tens of thousands of snapshots. And, and, and so we want to make sure they can take it at the granularity that they need it. Um, so super happy to bring that, uh, bring that into the hand of customers, uh, hands of customers as well. Yeah, that's a nice option. Okay, yeah. Ashish, Kami, thank you so much for coming back in theCUBE, helping us learn about uh, the, the, what's new and what's cool in, in EBS. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having us, Dave. Thank you for having us, Dave. You're very welcome. Now, if you want to learn more about EBS e e uh, resilience, stay right here because coming up, we've got a session <laughs> which is a deep dive on protecting mission critical workloads with, with Amazon EBS. Stay right there. You're watching theCUBE's coverage of AWS Storage Day 2022.